There's a bit of a divide in Christian thinking about what, are, what matters most for salvation, belief or action. In the evangelical tradition here and around the world, puts a very strong emphasis on belief as the gateway to personal salvation. This is why this branch of Christianity is often trumpeting John 3.16, which says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. In fact, the Gospel of John, plus the writings of Paul, tend to be evangelicals' go-to scriptures to support the argument that salvation comes through faith and belief, not actions. But there's a very different theological strand in the New Testament found often in the other three Gospels and in the often overlooked book of James, which emphasizes that, as James puts it, faith without works is dead. These alternate texts say very little about what Jesus expects his followers to believe about him and quite a lot about how he expects them to behave. And they tend to line up, broadly speaking, with a more mainline and progressive branch of Christianity. Now, today's gospel reading is really one of these despite its use of the word belief. And I should say for the record that I'm kind of a both and person on this. We don't have to choose one or the other, I think. And most Christians would agree with that. But I would simply caution that the strand that sort of emphasizes belief has had the loudest megaphone in our culture. So it's important not to forget the one that emphasizes behavior. In any case, in this gospel, Jesus is arguing with the temple authorities, whom the gospel portrays as sort of elite collaborators with Rome, corrupt officials. As usual, these authorities are trying to force Jesus to say something blasphemous so they can put him on trial. But he backs them into a verbal corner instead with his question about John's baptism. And then he tells this parable about a vineyard owner with two sons. One verbally refuses to work in his father's vineyard, but changes his mind and does so anyway. The other says he will work in the vineyard, maybe even believes he will, but doesn't. Which has done the father's will? The first, of course, Jesus' adversaries say, and then Jesus tells them that the tax collectors and prostitutes will enter the kingdom of God before they will, because these shunned and marginalized people have acted on John the Baptist's call to turn towards God, whereas they, the temple authorities, have instead been all talk. So the message in this text is clear. The economy of God's kingdom grows through actions more than through words. In the end, the important questions are not about what we said or believed. They're about whose lives we touched and how. Were we generous? Were we kind? Did we try to do right by others, especially when there was nothing to be gained. When the chips were down, did we have the courage to help those who were vulnerable? The standard is not perfection. All are broken and all have fallen short. All are in need of grace. But were we trying? Were we actually working in the vineyard or just claiming we would and putting it off? I think of the story of this English banker named Nicholas Winton. In December of 1938, instead of taking a skiing holiday in Switzerland, Winton joined a friend in Prague to help rescue Jewish children from Czechoslovakia. At the time, child refugees were allowed into Britain if there was a family that would sponsor them 
and a deposit of 50 pounds. For the next nine months, until the war began in September, Winton quit his job and worked tirelessly for this cause. He placed ads in British papers to connect Czech Jewish kids with sponsor families. He put up the 50 pounds himself and organized the kids' transport by train and ferry through the Netherlands to England. In all, Winton rescued 669 children, most of whose families died in the German camps. And these kids had no idea who had arranged their escape. Witten's heroism went largely unnoticed by the public until 40 plus years later, his wife found a scrapbook with the photos and identities of all these children that he had saved. A British talk show called That's Life got a hold of the book and tracked down many of the survivors. And then in sort of classic reality show fashion, that's Life arranged to put Winton in the audience of the show, surrounded by people that he'd saved unbeknownst to him. On camera, live, the host of the show told the story of what Winton had done, and then announced that one of the children he had saved was sitting next to him in the audience. A graceful woman in her mid-50s turned toward Winton grasped his hand and held it to her heart and embraced him. Then the host asked for anyone else whose life was saved by Mr. Winton to stand. About two dozen adults stood up in the studio audience. Winton gazed around them in bewilderment. All these grown people who wouldn't be here or anywhere if it weren't for him. He had to keep swiping his index fingers under his thick 80s glasses. It's the actions, not the words, that matter in the kingdom of God. Well, of course, we can't all be Nicholas Winton, but let's say a person dies and arrives at the gates of heaven. Let's say the person is you or me when our time comes. St. Peter looks up from his ledger and tells you he's a little behind in processing folks, but there's a waiting room right through this door, and it shouldn't be too much longer now. In you go to what looks like some kind of party. People of various ages are milling about a central table with all your personal favorite hors d'oeuvres as you load up on caramelized onions and phyllo dough or sweaty pile of buffalo wings or, you know, whatever's your thing, people start coming up and introducing themselves to you. Some of them look vaguely familiar. I'm the girl you stuck up for when I was bullied in fifth grade. I'm the young man you mentored on the job back in the early 2000s. You don't know me but you gave to an organization that bought my mother a goat in Nepal so we could have a livelihood. I'm one of your kid's friends, and I learned how to be a loving parent by watching you whenever I was over at your house. I'm this one, I'm that one, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the. Gradually it becomes clear that everyone in the room is someone you helped in some way. They're all here to thank you. In some cases, for things you don't even remember doing, you can't believe how many of them there are either. No, you're not Nicholas Winton or Mother Teresa or Nelson Mandela, but you can live a life that brings you to that waiting room where you take in that you have touched way more lives than you ever knew. And that's when you realize that you are not waiting to enter the kingdom of heaven. You're already there. Amen.